Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native and the father of the Effortless English System that trains you to speak English fluently, speak English powerfully, think in English, speak English confidently, speak English effortlessly. When you commit to my VIP program, at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com That's where you join. That's where you commit. EffortlessEnglishClub.com How are you? Feeling good today? I hope so. I was reading the Bhagavad Gita again today. Such a great book. The Bhagavad Gita is fantastic. And again, you know, I had thoughts about this age we live in. This age we live in. I think that, you know, people, you can look at human history, look at their writings, what people have written in the past. Of course, there has always been suffering. There have always been problems. There has always been good and evil. Yeah, obviously. That's life. But what's different about our our modern age? Well, I think we all agree. We can all clearly agree and see. It's very obvious, at least in written history, that we know this is the most materialistic age. Age here means, again, time period, right? Age means time period. Of course, age also means, you know, your age. How old are you? I am 20, I'm 30, whatever. But here, age has a different meaning. Here, age means time period. Kind of a long time period. So, our modern age, our modern time period is very materialistic. When did it start? I don't know. You know, you can argue about that. We can think of different dates in history when it really started, but I think most of us can see that certainly in the last hundred or so years, this has increased incredibly quickly, starting with the Industrial Revolution, right? The age of machines. And now, just getting faster and faster and faster, more and more and more and more materialistic. What does that mean exactly? We talk about materialism a lot. You'll see this in uh, in the news. You'll see people writing about materialism all the time, often criticizing it. What does that mean, really, though? What do we mean when we say materialism? Materialism. Well, material. Material means physical things. Something that is physical, material. I mean, something is physical, meaning you can touch it, you can see it, right? That's material. The, the general way we use this word material, it's, it's kind of the stuff you use to make things. Like you say, I need some material to make this shirt. What does that mean? Well, it means you need, you need the fabric, right? You need the clothes, the cloth, Cotton, for example. I mean, you need cotton, and then the cotton, it's the raw material. Raw meaning you haven't cut it yet. You haven't done any work. You haven't used it in any way. Or if you're making a car, you need, you know, steel, or you need plastic, or whatever, right? You need these materials, right? These are the, the basic things, these, the physical things you can see and touch. That's material. So, materialism, materialism is the belief or the attitude that things, 
physical things are most important in life. That that's what life is. That life is material. In other words, materialism means that you have no belief in God, no belief in spirit, no belief in soul. Any of these things you can't directly see or touch are meaningless or imaginary or unimportant. So it means the physical world is most important. Or the physical world is the only world that is real. That's materialism. And of course, if you have that belief, then you would believe that the most important thing then would be, or things would be to, uh, for example, number one, make your body live as long as possible, maybe even forever. That your body is more important than your mind or spirit. Which means what a lot of materialists um, believe. They don't often say it directly, but what you can see from their actions, what they believe is that physical pleasure, that pleasure is the most important thing in life. But by pleasure, they mean physical pleasure. So that would be, that might be sex, that might be food, it might be, you know, anything. There's lots of ways to have physical pleasure. But this idea that physical pleasure then is really the, the main focus of life. To get as much physical pleasure as possible. So that's part of materialism. You know, another part of materialism is, is to collect things, right? And this is a lot of times when people criticize materialism, this, they're talking about this, meaning that, that money is most important, but not really money. It's not really the money that they're talking about. I mean, they'll say money, but money is also a, a little bit unreal. Money is kind of an idea. But what they're really talking about is things, buying things with your money, right? So cars and houses and expensive clothing and, you know, super nice food and all of these things jewelry things 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 that this that's what makes you happy or important and you can see it's connected right it's connected to the idea of pleasure again it's this idea that these physical things are most important in life and that therefore it's the physical things meaning physical pleasure physical objects that's what gives us you people Happiness. That's what gives happiness. Happiness is found in getting the most physical pleasure and the most physical things, objects. That's really at the root of materialism. Now, connected then, you know, you can see if, if this is the central belief you have, or if someone has the central belief, that then they also have the idea that Improving things, improving physical things, will then improve happiness. And this is what we get with technology, right? This age of materialism, we are dominated by people who believe this, who believe that if we just improve things enough, meaning technology, then eventually everybody will be happy We'll have the utopia, the perfect society, right? We can cure all diseases, right? Physical, right? So again, physical, the physical body. Cure all physical diseases. And um, no hunger. We already have, in most places in, in the West, we already have done this, no hunger. Certainly in America. Nobody's starving in America. Almost nobody. So this is a communist or Marxist idea. Marxists are completely materialistic. But it's also uh, some extreme capitalists also have a very materialistic mindset. 
they they have different ideas on what system to use, but in this they share the same basic idea that the most important thing is the physical, the material things. You'll see this sometimes, you know, people think, oh, you know, if we just, we get technology good enough, if our technology gets good enough, you know, we can go to the stars, we can go to space, that would be cool, but that that'll make us happy and everything will be perfect. Materialism, right? That the idea is that we need to make the physical world perfect or much, much, much better, and then everyone will be happier. We'll all be super happy if we do that. So this is where, like I said, the Marxist and even really just left wing kind of mindset comes from, but also some of the right wing, the very capitalistic, industrial right wing even. That's kind of a similar idea. It's interesting they agree on this. But this is not the traditional mindset at all. Certainly not. This is a new thing in human history, this idea, at least for it to be dominant, for it to be so popular. Because this idea of materialism rules our global society. Globalism is a materialistic movement, a materialistic power, right? Everywhere in the world, the globalists, they want to unite us, they say, and people think that's good, but they want to unite us as slaves, and they want to unite us as materialists. They want everyone in the world worshipping things, money, things, technology, pleasure, physical pleasure. And this is why the world seems like it's becoming the same everywhere and why the traditions, the local traditions of nations around the world, cultures around the world are disappearing and they're all becoming the same, but not in a good way. The same ugliness, the same materialism. And that's why, you know, that's why you understand what I'm talking about right now. That's why I know you understand this and I don't even know what country you're in right now. You might be in Europe, you might be in Africa, you might be in South America, you might be in Asia, you might be in North America. But I, are, I know that you understand this because this materialistic age is global. It's everywhere. Materialism. So that's what materialism means. Ultimately, if you really look at the roots of it, materialism, materialism is about denying God, denying spirit or soul, denying any kind of spirituality. Even denying virtue. Now, a lot of materialists and atheists and such will say, they'll argue with that, but if you really look at their thinking, and if you really look at this mindset, this deep belief, it, that's what happens. Eventually, all virtue is destroyed. Because, you know, virtue is not, virtue is not materialistic. Courage. You, you can't touch courage. It's not a thing. Duty, loyalty, honor. Wisdom. Righteousness, holiness. These are not materialistic virtues at all. All the traditional virtues of all traditional cultures around the world, they're not materialistic. And so eventually materialism destroys virtue. And that's why now we live in such an unvirtuous society, global society. Why virtue is dying. Why virtue is very hard to find now. At all levels. It's, it's hard to find at all levels. It's hard to find virtue, virtuous people in government. <laughs> That's a joke. In the media, I forget it. In education, eh, a few people, but not many. Even in just the general public. You'll meet people who are nice. Plenty of nice people, but not many virtuous people. 
you know, virtuous, being virtuous is not being nice. We're going to talk about this in a minute. We've got a lot of very nice people, but very few virtuous people. Because materialism destroys it. Ultimately, these virtues are spiritual. They depend on a belief, a knowledge, that there is something more than just the material. Something more than just the physical. Of course, different people have different ideas. What is it? You know, you can call it spirituality, you can call it God, you can call it religion, Tao, many names and, and ideas about it, but... For virtue, you need that. So that is why, when you look around, you see so much corruption. You know, where you can look into in the media, uh, music, for example, and it's, it's almost pornography now. It's pretty disgusting. You can see the media pushing all kinds of, you know, s- creepy, nasty, terrible stuff even on children. You can see everywhere, pleasure, 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 people addicted to pleasure, pursuing pleasure, thinking pleasure, right, is the highest, most important value or goal. Just feel good. And, of course, they don't care if (laughs) if that affects other people badly. And this is why people who are virtuous or who want to be virtuous, who have a kind of a good heart, this is why you see so much feeling of loneliness and frustration, weakness, low confidence, confusion, isolation, Because these people, maybe you and me, were surrounded by this materialism, this materialistic mindset, this materialistic culture and society. Our governments are materialistic. Our merchants, our business people are materialistic. Now, I know that seems, it seems strange, like maybe they should be, right? But... Not necessarily. It's possible to be a business person, but not believe that it's the top thing, right? It's part of life, but it doesn't have to be the top of life. We're surrounded by corruption, moral corruption, M-O-R-A-L, moral corruption. That's what it means to be, to have all these materialistic societies with, where virtue is almost lost, some people have it here and there, but it's not... If you look at the general culture, the education systems, the media systems, the governments, the you know, all these big things that, that are form our societies, it's very difficult to find virtue and corruption is deep and terrible and everywhere. And so this is the big difference with our modern age. This is... I guess our challenge for our age. People in the past had other challenges. People in the past, in the far past, for example, certainly had more material challenges than we do. They were not materialistic in the past. Not as much, at least. And they were not as advanced. The technology was not as advanced, so they did suffer more from uh, hunger and disease and things like that. Although I'm not sure about the disease part. They suffered more from some kinds of diseases, like infections. And they suffered more from injuries, physical injuries. We have good medicine for those too now. But we have other... Anyone knows now, right? If you work in the medical industry, the medical area, you know, we have a lot of other medical problems. Our diseases are things like diabetes and cancer and heart disease caused by our materialistic lifestyle, right? Caused by our food, caused by our laziness, 
caused by our technology, the chemicals that we're drinking and eating. All of that unnatural stuff is causing a lot of sickness. So, when people, you know, on one hand, I, we could, if I look at America, for example, I can look and see, well, okay, 100 years ago or 200 years ago in America, on one hand, people had more physical problems, perhaps, meaning, right, if they got sick from a dis- serious disease, probably more likely to die. If they got a serious injury, more likely to die. That's true. They didn't have good medical technology. But on the other hand, they were much more healthy and fit. On the other hand, nowadays in America, we have a whole country of extremely fat people who are fat and tired and lazy and extremely, very, very, very unhealthy. Is that better? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that's better. It's a kind of deep corruption. I don't think we improved. I don't think that's an improvement. I mentioned the Bhagavad Gita. I was reading the Bhagavad Gita and I found one of my favorite sections. I'm going to read it now. This is Krishna again. Remember Krishna? Krishna is um, an avatar of God, meaning like uh, uh, he's in human form, but it's kind of God on earth, right? So he's in the limited form, but it's still God on earth. So kind of similar to how Christians feel about Jesus. And Arjuna is talking, I mean, uh, uh, Krishna is talking to Arjuna. Arjuna is just a human, a normal person. And he's giving him advice, right? Remember, they're about to fight a big battle. Arjuna doesn't want to fight. And he says to him, Krishna says to him, unless God says to him, stand up, win glory, conquer the enemy, rule. Already I have struck them down. You are just my instrument. Wow, I love that section. I love that quote. It is so powerful. Let's review what it means. So remember, Arjuna is the leader of one army. He's the good guy. He's good. He's fighting another army. They're evil. They're evil because they lie and cheat, and they've already done a lot of evil things in the story before this. So it's the final big battle between these two armies, an evil army and a good one. Arjuna is the leader of the good one. But in some ways, he's too good. In some ways, he's too good, meaning he's too kind. He's too compassionate, right? He has that great soft virtue of compassion and caring and kindness. We all appreciate that. It's very important. But because of that, because his compassion, his kindness is so great that he looks across, he looks at the, ba- the uh, army, the other army, and he starts to feel bad for them. He starts to feel bad for his enemies. So, you know, they, we say, love your enemies, right? Well, he actually feels that. He feels sad. He, he, he realizes, oh, if, we, if, if I fight the battle, if we fight this battle, I have to kill them. They're going to suffer. They're going to die. And of course, you know, my army is going to kill many, many, many of them. They're going to suffer and die. I have to kill them. And some of them, I think, are, you know, they're they're used to be his friends. Before they betrayed him. But still, even though they betrayed him, he still has that kindness. He still, you know, basically has that compassion and love even for his enemies, even for these people who are, are evil. And they are his enemies and they're trying to destroy him. And yet, he still has that great kindness and compassion. And he sits down and he's like, I I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't cause that suffering. I can't kill them. And of course, he realizes too, in the battle, people on his own side are also going to die. And this is the, you know, this is the Bhagavad Gita. This is the 
the whole Bhagavad Gita is he sits down and he just uh, I can't do it what do I and then he looks to Krishna his advisor who is God and he says Krishna what should I do I can't help me and Krishna does not <laughs> Krishna gives him those hard virtues okay he gives him a lot of wisdom too it teaches him all about life and death and God and virtue and duty and it's amazing but overall he gives him those hard virtues he tells him this is not a time for compassion and kindness and softness instead he gives this quote I'll read it again stand up win glory conquer the enemy rule already I have struck them down you are just my instrument that's some hard virtue right there <laughs> okay he gives him some hard red pill advice right there okay first of all he says stand up all right Arjuna sits down in weakness in kindness but still in weakness so he says stand up be a man stand up and fight And he says, win glory. Glory is like honor. Right? So he means fight and win that glory. Fight courageously. Win that glory, that kind of uh, respect that you earn. And then he says, conquer the enemy. Defeat the enemy. Destroy the enemy. Don't be kind to the enemy. Now is not the time for kindness and compassion. They are trying to kill you, Arjuna. They are attacking you. They are evil. Conquer them. Defeat them. And then rule. Become the ruler. Become the king. Become the boss. And then he gives the kind of spiritual advice or spiritual teaching he says already I I meaning God I have already struck them down to strike them down means to hit them down means to kill them in this case means to kill them he's basically saying I have already killed them Arjuna I God right because nobody lives forever death is certain if you don't kill them they're still going to die they still will die sometime. If you don't fight them now, they'll die later from something else. And then later, you know, in a different part of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, and if, if you don't fight them now, they are going to kill you. They're going to kill your family. They're going to kill your people, destroy your people. They will become the rulers, right? And they will create a very evil kingdom and many 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 people will suffer many more people will suffer if you don't fight and still eventually they the enemy they still will die but there will be a lot more suffering if you don't fight so he says I don't worry Arjuna I have already killed them right you are not the master of life and death I am he says you are just my instrument you are my instrument means my tool he's saying to Arjuna you are the tool of God I am using you Arjuna to fight evil you are serving me when you do this so stand up and fight Woo, that's powerful powerful when you think about it you really think about that little section. That is sort of the opposite of what we get in our modern materialistic culture now. Because the message we are getting constantly, repeatedly in the fake schools and the fake media, we get the big lie. They teach us the big lie. Really, there's two big lies, I think, but let's talk about one of them. One of the big lies is always be nice. You must always be nice always be nice that means they say diff in different ways be tolerant always be tolerant you must tolerate everybody tolerate means accept right tolerance 
Tolerance is, they say tolerance is a virtue. Accepting everybody is a virtue. And then connected to this, you know, always be nice. Always be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Be nice to everyone. Be nice in all situations. That is the exact opposite of what the Bhagavad Gita is saying, what Krishna is saying. He's the exact opposite. Because Krishna is saying, no, you do not always be nice. You do not always be kind. You do not always be soft. There's a time for that, but this is not the time. This is the time to stand up and fight. Defeat the enemy. Destroy the enemy. You are my instrument. Krishna does not say to tolerate and accept the enemy. Don't tolerate their evil. Don't accept their evil. You don't tolerate evil. You fight it and destroy it. That's what Krishna says. But in our fake schools, and our fake media, the Marxists especially, love, love, love to talk about tolerance and being nice. Of course, they're actually not very nice people, but they this is their propaganda. Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. What that really means, always be nice and always tolerate others, no matter what they do. What it really means is cowardice. Cowardice against evil. Weakness or cowardice against evil. Right? Cowardice means you're a wimp. A coward is someone who is afraid and they won't fight when they should. A coward runs away. It's the opposite of courage, right? A courageous person fights, even when they're afraid. Now, everybody is afraid in those scary situations. Everybody's afraid. Fear is not the problem, okay? It's not about fear. Fear is normal. Everybody feels fear. Even great heroes have fear. But what's different? The ones who have courage, they fight anyway, even though they're afraid. They're afraid, they're super afraid, but they still fight because it's the right thing to do. That's what courage means. They find some power, some strength inside to fight anyway, even when they're afraid. The coward's the opposite. The coward just runs away and never fights. So this is the excuse of cowardice. Always be nice. I'm just being tolerant, right? They'll say, oh, just be tolerant. Just be tolerant. They're giving you an excuse. They're trying to teach you to be weak. Don't fight evil. You have to accept it. You have to tolerate it. Don't fight evil. You have to be nice. Don't raise your voice. Don't say mean things to bad people. Don't argue with bad people. If somebody's bad or evil or disgusting or corrupt, don't criticize them and never use a loud voice be weak be a coward that's what you are taught right think about this in school oh my god they te- this is what they teach you right you almost be nice be nice be nice be nice be nice always doesn't matter what the situation is they don't care if you're not nice you get punished and the same with tolerance right where uh, I'll use my favorite example because I, it's so stupid <laughs> But the whole, you know, the trans thing with the the women, uh, it's usually men, actually, who pretend to be women, who think they're women, and they have kind of a mental disease. And we're told we must tolerate them. You must be tolerant. If you don't tolerate them, meaning you don't accept them, it means you're bad and hateful. You have to be nice to them. You have to tolerate them. Accept them. You have to accept the lie. You have to accept their mental illness. You have to be a coward. Instead of saying the truth, you have to tolerate that. And this is true for many, 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 many other things. It's a common Marxist technique. They'll say, oh, you're not tolerant. It means you're hateful. It means you're bad. That's That's how they'll attack you and criticize you. You must fight them anyway. You cannot tolerate evil. You cannot tolerate immorality. You cannot tolerate corruption. You cannot tolerate lies. You cannot tolerate abuse. You cannot tolerate mental illness that is destructive. 
That's what Krishna is saying in the Bhagavad Gita. No, you don't tolerate it. You stand up and you fight. You conquer the enemy. So what's the opposite of this? This be nice, be nice, be nice. Okay, if you look at, by the way, if you look through human history, you will not, you will not find nice as a virtue. Aristotle did not describe nice as a virtue. Plato and his cardinal virtues. There's no mention of nice. He doesn't mention nice. Nice is not one of the cardinal virtues. If you look at the you know, the, the traditional virtues of cultures around the world. There's no nice, okay? The samurai warrior Bushido, the code of Bushido, the virtues of a samurai. There's no nice. Be nice is not one of them. Be tolerant is not one of them. Now, compassion is, but again, that's not the same as being nice. What you will find, one of the cardinal virtues, usually people say Plato was the first one to mention these. Courage or fortitude. Fortitude is really the, I believe, the uh, more direct translation, but we can just call it courage, fortitude, strength. It's kind of all those ideas together. It's, it's basically what Krishna is telling Arjuna to do in this part of the Bhagavad Gita. Have courage. Be strong and have courage. That's part of his advice. So courage. So for example, Achilles. Those of you who know the Iliad, Achilles, the great hero of the Iliad, the great Greek hero, has tremendous courage. In fact, Achilles is almost, uh, he's almost like a superman. Uh, he's, he just, he's not afraid of anything. He has, he, he's kind of a difference. I, I, I need to read the Iliad again, but I, I can't remember any time in the Iliad. I can't remember any time when Achilles is afraid. He has other problems. <laughs> he's, 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 he has a bad temper. He gets really angry easily. Um, but he has tremendous courage. Uh, Lord of the Rings. If you, some of you guys are fans of Lord of the Rings. That you, maybe you know Lord of the Rings more than the Iliad seen the movies or the read the books so Lord of the Rings courage is a virtue you can quite clearly Tolkien the writer uh, believed that courage was a very important virtue I mean this, it's a one of the one of the strong messages of the whole book the whole story Lord of the Rings courage 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 that courage is such an important virtue right and that courage is powerful I mean, this is the message of the hobbits, the little hobbits. The hobbits are not strong physically, right? They're little. Frodo's little. Sam and Mary and Pippin, they're all small. They're not super fighters. They're not super smart. Right? They, 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 they're, they're compared to many of the other characters and heroes in the book, they're actually, they're quite small and weak and little and Eh, not not really very smart either. But what they do have is this virtue of courage or fortitude, right? They have great courage. Even though they are small, they go up and they face, they go against, they fight against terrible, terrible, terrible evil. Very, 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 very powerful evil. They somehow have this courage, this fortitude to move forward anyway to fight anyway, to do the right thing anyway. And that's why I think that they are really the, the main heroes of the book. Certainly Frodo is. And Tolkien's giving us a message about that, right? That even small people, Meaning just normal people is what he's saying. Frodo, Frodo and the hobbits are just like regular normal people, like everyday people, like me and you. He's saying even regular everyday people can do great things when you have courage. When you have courage. When you have this virtue and you're a good person, you can do 
amazing, great things that will surprise you, that will surprise many people. It's a great message. And of course, in right here in the Bhagavad Gita, same thing. Krishna is telling him to stand up and fight. Be courageous. Now, another virtue I believe that Krishna is teaching Arjuna, or really reminding him, he has these virtues already, but he's reminding them him about this, is another cardinal virtue, which is righteousness. Righteousness. So it's another one of those, Plato had four cardinal virtues, some say five, he mentioned another one later, four or five, cardinal meaning, uh, you know, central, central virtues, most important virtues. Four or five, he mentioned four in one part and then he mentioned another one later, so we could say five total. Well, this is one of them too, righteousness, uh, in, a lot of people translate it as justice, but I think righteousness is a better one. Righteousness means judgment. It means to judge good and evil. That's what it means. Justice, righteousness, judgment, all these things. This virtue means that you judge good and evil. Not tolerate. It's the opposite of tolerance. It's the exact opposite of tolerance, the Marxist idea. It's saying, no, you don't tolerate at all. You judge. A lot of people, too, you'll see this in our media, our fake news, our fake media, that they talk about, oh, don't judge, don't judge, like it's a bad thing. No, 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 no. Judging is a good thing. Judging is necessary. Judging is a virtue. But you have to be good at it. That means you see evil clearly and you judge it accurately, clearly. That is evil. And you see good clearly and you judge it correctly. That is good. You don't get confused about those two. That's what it means, this virtue. And then it means that you take action. You do the necessary action. You support the good. You fight the evil. You have an obligation to God, a duty to God, in fact, to judge evil and to fight it. That's what this virtue means justice or righteousness or judgment so you can see maybe you can see now how this materialism this mindset of materialism the Marxist materialism has corrupted has taught us the exact opposite of the cardinal virtues these great traditional virtues the exact opposite Tolerance instead of judgment. Judgment is what we want, but we want good judgment, meaning accurate, clear judgment, intelligent judgment. Bad judgment means you see something evil and you say it's good. You see something that is corrupt and you say it's good. That's bad judgment. Your judgment is wrong. Good judgment, the virtue here, this judgment of righteousness, justice, judgment means you clearly, this is good, this is evil, this is corrupt, this is not, this is pure, this is ugly, this is beautiful. Absolutely, that's a virtue. One of the four or five most important virtues, according to Plato and many others. You know, Plato's virtues, they had a huge influence because um, Aristotle, of course, was influenced by them, but also the, the whole uh, church in the West, the Christian churches ad adopted, means used his virtues, his cardinal virtues, and taught them, and uh, also had influence as well throughout the Islamic world because the Islamic world... Um, also found the works of Plato and Aristotle and preserved them and taught them. So, a big, big effect, really, in this spread worldwide. These, so, these cardinal virtues are very powerful. Judgment or justice. This is what Krishna is saying when he says, you are my instrument, you are my tool, you are my instrument. He means... 
I'm using you to judge them. I'm using you to create justice, right? To fight evil and support good. That's what he's saying in that quote. When he says, you are my instrument. He's saying justice. He's talking about the virtue of justice here. So number one, he says you need courage. You must fight. Stand up and fight. Don't be a coward and run away. But number two, why should you stand up and fight in this situation? Why fight in this situation? In this situation, why not be soft? Why not be compassionate in this situation? Why? Because of judgment, justice, righteousness. Because of this virtue. Because you can clearly see in this situation they are evil. Your side is good. You are fighting for good. You are fighting against evil. You must use your judgment for justice. This is your duty, Arjuna. This is your obligation. You must do this to serve me. When you do this, you are serving me. You are working with me. Very powerful. So what about you and me in this age of materialism we find ourselves where everything's backwards like a mirror where the fake schools and the fake media they say evil is good and they say good is evil. They say tolerance is a virtue and judgment is bad. They say niceness always be nice is a virtue but courage is bad. They say there is no God, no spirit, no soul. And really, ultimately, that means no virtue. Nothing that's not physical. Only the physical is important or real. That's what they say. And they say that any way you want to get physical pleasure is fine. If you want to... Uh, get married and then have lots and lots and lots and lots of women or lots and lots and lots of men and then get divorced and get divorced again and get divorced again and get divorced again and uh, leave your children because they're annoying to you and you don't you don't want to deal with them it's no fun it's not pleasurable anymore to deal with them and you just want to run around and party and drink and and do drugs and watch pornography and do everything possible for maximum physical pleasure and that's all great that's what they're teaching us and indeed that's what many 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 people are doing And it's getting worse and worse and worse. Each year it gets worse. And this is everywhere in the world. Some places a little better, some places worse, but the direction, every place around the world that I know, is moving that direction, getting worse and worse and worse. What can you do? I mean, no wonder, right? Now you understand you're a good person. And... I know you have these virtues, at least a little bit inside you. I know you do. These cardinal virtues, including these two. Because you do see, and you do judge, and you do realize this is bad, and this is good. This is beautiful, and this is ugly. Of course you do, because you're a human. You're a decent, good human being. And I know you have some courage inside of you, and you know that courage is good. And I know that you know that sometimes you do have to fight. You know that you can't always be nice, nice, nice. You can't be nice to bad people. You can't be nice to evil people. You can't sit down and quit like Arjuna was trying to do. You can't do that. Because then everything just gets even worse. You believe in virtue and therefore you believe in something more than just the physical, than just pleasure. I know you because I know the Effortless English family. 
I've traveled around the world meeting effortless English family members so I know what you're like and I know that's not you but you're living in a world surrounded by all, all of this maybe you didn't realize it maybe haven't really thought about it so much maybe you haven't understood the problem but I imagine that and I know for many you know there is that feeling of something's wrong there's just something wrong okay on one hand yeah we have lots of money lots of food airplanes and computers and the internet that all seems great but there's something missing there's something wrong things are moving in a bad direction there's a feeling of frustration right there's a feeling of confusion sometimes like like I feel something's wrong but I I just don't know why I feel like I'm, you know, I'm not connected. I feel like a little bit lonely or frustrated or like my confidence isn't high or there or this feeling like I don't have a purpose or I don't agree with all of this around me, but it seems like everybody else does. Uh, what's wrong? Surrounded by the lies and corruption. It's hard. It's difficult. So, of course, it's it's easy to be confused, especially when you're young. Because you don't understand what's happening. You have these kind of feelings, but you know everybody's telling you the opposite. That's the purpose of the fake schools. That's why they do it, to confuse the young. They get you when you're very young and teach you the opposite of the virtues, of truth. So then it's hard to wake up. It's just like Neo in the Matrix. Let's come back to our one of our favorite movies, The Matrix, right? In the beginning of The Matrix, before he wakes up, before the red pill, Neo is, he just feels something's wrong. He's searching, he's searching, right? Morpheus says this to him before the red pill. Have you, Neo, have you felt something's wrong, right? All your life, you've been searching for the answer. All your life, you felt this, there's just something wrong with the world. It's the same idea, right? That's a pretty heavy, deep movie, actually, The Matrix, with some pretty deep messages, actually. And then he wakes up, he takes the red pill, and he realizes, oh, the whole Matrix was a big lie. The whole thing was a lie. And the truth is really, really, really ugly. (laughs) It's terrible, right? He wakes up on that ship, and it's, it's horrible. The world is a terrible thing. It's really horrible. But it's the first step for him to join the fight and the fight back and for humans to win, right? To come back again. So the, but the first step is hard. Seeing all that, waking up. And the same way here, it's hard to wake up from all this. But eventually it's beautiful. Because virtue is beautiful. You will live a more beautiful life when you focus on virtue instead of pleasure. Because pleasure is ultimately a lie. This is one way we know that materialism itself is a lie. That there's something wrong with that belief, that mentality. That everything is just physical and just pleasure is the key to life. We know this is wrong We can by testing it. Because if you do that and you just focus on pleasure, 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 you will feel good for a while, but it's an addiction. It becomes an addiction very fast and then you need more and you need more and you need more and it never satisfies you. It never seems to make you happy in the long term. In fact, the opposite happens. You become less and less and less happy the more materialistic you become. You might get more power, you might get more money, you might get a lot more physical pleasure, and yet more and more and more unhappy, more and more and more miserable. The drug addict is the perfect example of this. The drug addict gets incredible physical pleasure. Again, I'll use the heroin example. Okay, heroin, I'm sure, feels very, very good Listen to a heroin addict talked. They do it because it feels amazing. You know, they describe it as the most incredible physical pleasure ever. 
ever, more than anything you can imagine, more than sex, more than drinking, more than any physical pleasure, heroin is better. I believe them. I'm sure that's the truth, for sure. And yet, we know, <laughs> we, all you have to do is look at the life of a heroin addict. Is it a life of happiness? No, it's a, it's a life of self-destruction. So we have this very extreme example of materialism, the heroin addict pursuing, you know, chasing, trying to get the highest, highest, highest physical pleasure possible. And what happens? They destroy their lives. They become the most miserable, unhappy, disgusting people in the world. Horrible. They destroy themselves. That's the extreme example, but, you know, it's people who uh, think money is the most important thing and that's all. And just things, buying things, 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 things. It's the same as heroin. It's just a little less fast. It's, a le it's less destructive than heroin because the pleasure's smaller. But it's the same basic path you will see. And this is the path of a lot of the, you know, famous Hollywood people, for example. That you always see on the reality shows, right? That, that buy all the cars and houses and all this stuff, right? Well, it's the same idea. They're pursuing the same materialistic religion, fake religion. And it also leads to unhappiness. It just doesn't work. It's wrong. It is wrong. Materialism is wrong. Now, what is right? We can, you know, that's a different question that's very, very big. But materialism is wrong. Meaning, it does not create happiness. It creates unhappiness. And the more materialistic you become or believe or think or do or act, the more unhappy you will be long term. That, it's clear evidence can't argue it. Absolutely. There is something more. So what can you do? You know this. I know you know this. I think the reason I keep talking about this kind of topic is that um, I think this is what we need. I've, I think about this all the time. Because it's a really big question. Because I, I meet a lot of people who are frustrated, and especially younger people, uh, but even older people. So I, that's why I'm constantly thinking about this question. And even in my own life, I think about it. I struggle with this. It is the great question and problem of our age. It's the one we must fix. We must find a solution for. This is our battle. And I'm a very kind and compassionate person. Th those soft virtues are easy for me. They're very natural for me. And probably for you and many of other people too, many of the effortless English family. They're kind, friendly, very gentle people. And that's wonderful. But I've realized that our age, just like Arjuna in that battle, our age is calling us telling us, demanding different virtues. What we need now are courage and judgment, righteousness, justice, fortitude, right? All these different words, similar meanings. We need courage and judgment we need those harder virtues, those stronger virtues now. That's the challenge of our age, of our lives. The softer virtues, yes, with our families, our friends, our people. But in this greater war, battle, it's these harder virtues we need. Courage or fortitude. And judgment, justice, righteousness. 
So what can you do? It's simple. It's the same advice that Krishna gave Arjuna. What must you do? Arise. Arise means stand up. Stand up and fight. Fight for what? Fight for yourself and your virtue. Fight for your family. Fight for your people. Fight for your home. Fight for truth. Fight for virtue. Commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Join and commit today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com